everyone, and welcome to the first of a series I'm going to do. So we here at RCH for the Saturday um, German Longsword class took the past couple months to cover Codex Wallerstein of the Nuremberg group. Now, Wallerstein is a fun little treatise because one, it's part of many. The Nuremberg group is kind of its own separate series of tradition. Um, it has similarities, of course, with Lichtenauer, as most German fencing will, but is really it's its own thing. It showcases a lot of cool things, and if I spoke Old German better, I would definitely be trying to translate some of those untranslatable things. But if you're curious about the Nuremberg group, you can look it up on Wittenauer and follow along with the series as it goes. But either way, we covered the longsword section of Codex Wallerstein, and it was such a big hit and really has some great lessons in it that I decided to go ahead and make it be the first technique breakdown series that we've done on the channel. And here to help me is uh, Ryan, also known as Yellow Hat Ryan. Uh, you can guess why. He has been following along in the Saturday classes, and I'll have a couple other students from that class assisting me over the course of this series. But for right now, what we're going to be covering is going to be the first two plays of um, Codex Wallerstein, which is really more like the first two concepts, because especially with these early plays, what it's really showing us is some understanding of concept with a situational technique. Now, first and foremost, what's interesting about um, Codex Wallerstein is that it is not, it, it most all comes from a bind, um, specifically a bind position that is called the scales. So let's go over how that is formed. So the images show us they're just kind of already in it, but it can be presumed that the scales come from any time the blades bind. So going back up a little bit, there we go. So, you know, if we come in approaching each other like we're going to fight, and we come in, from here we position ourselves down into the scales. And what it says is to lower yourself, make yourself big with the sword and small with the body, right? Now, the reason I'm doing this is because right now I'm essentially putting everything behind this body. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm limited in my movement. If I want to, at any point, I can come back out and do whatever I'm going to do. But the important thing is that in that moment of binding, I'm solid and I'm ready to fight them. Now, does this mean that in Nuremberg everyone fought like this, where we, you know, we're about to fight and we both come out here first then do our techniques? No, I do not believe that is the case. What this probably is, is the fact that, I mean, most fencers, a common fencer, if you put a sword in somebody's hand, they will be able to cut. With a little bit of experience, they'll be able to cut in combinations. This stuff all comes from the bind because that's what they thought was worthwhile writing down, right? I'm not going to tell someone how to, you know, I can tell them how to throw a better punch, but if they can punch already, I'm really more interested in teaching them how to dodge than anything else, right? Same kind of idea here. Everyone can cut. They will end up in binds. So let's give, let's write down the important techniques that you can do from binds. At least that's my theory. Either way though, our first position is the scales as we just showed. And from here, what it's really meant to do is be a place for us to feel pressure. Now, how long should you be standing in the scales? Not that long. Can we fight from here? Yes, but it's probably only going to be moments like this. So, we come in, we make ourselves small, I maybe advance on him, he's not having it, I maybe fall back, etc. Really quick series of actions, and that's probably the longest you would stay in it. It's from here I just jump into my next motion, depending upon what I feel. So, that's pretty much um, length. The first part of it is called length, the second part of it is called measure that we're covering today. That's pretty much it, just moving down into the scale. So let's go over how to form the scales specifically. What you want to do is have your sword extended in front of you. Again, you'll want a 45 or 30 degree angle. You'll want to lower yourself down so that you are equally split. I'm not front leg heavy, I'm not rear leg heavy. I'm nice and balanced, my right leg is forward. I'm going to tuck my elbows in, I'm going to keep my posture upright, and I'm going to really put myself behind the sword. Now what's fun about the Nuremberg group is that we have a couple different periods that are drawing the same techniques, which is always super useful because you can cross-reference how things have changed. In the earlier depiction, we see what seems to be a little bit more of a spring into it. Now take in mind medieval art can always, well early Renaissance art, can always be a little bit weird, but it seems more like they're springing into this position, landing and then going off of it, versus the later period seems to show a bit more of a solid stance in it. Either way, though, you end up about the same place. So, what can we do out of the scales? From here, we get our next technique, which is measure. 
Now, measure is actually a couple different techniques. And it says that if I come into the scales and find him, you know, generally weak upon the sword. Now, weak upon the sword does not mean that he's, you know, just loosey-goosey, nothing happening there. It just means that he is not actively fighting for the middle. And that's an important difference, right? Because if he's entirely weak upon the sword, we have a technique later that we'll deal with it by moving it out of the way. This, he's just not actively fighting me yet. So we're here. It says to simply extend and thrust at him. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to extend my arms, move forward with a small step, and then recover back along this same line. Nice and simple. So now I'm going to throw on my mask and we'll show it a couple times. straightforward. I come onto that bind. I don't feel that he's fighting back very much, and I extend. Now, as you saw, he will start to kind of curl up sometimes and try to deal with the point, but because I'm taking that initiative and I'm in a very prime position to go against him, he doesn't really have a ton of time to really do anything back against me or even really defend himself without being in a really bad position. If he tries to move back all the way to see off my point, then I can just cut around or things of that nature but that's if he really dedicates himself to not getting hit, right? A more likely response that he would do, based upon what we see later, is going to be the idea of either winding against my thrust or alternatively falling back. So what that might look like is, we're here, Ryan goes to stab me in the face, I'm going to move with him, control that line again, and then I can launch my own attack back, or alternatively, we come in, he goes to stab at me, and I'm going to take that moment to attack back at him. These are all the more likely responses that someone's going to do when they're fighting for the center line like, right, like that and they get caught soft. But that's the first response. It's a very useful one. A lot of people don't think about just that straight along extension. It catches a lot more people than you would expect. The trick with it is to maintain that 45 slash 30 degree angle, nice smooth extension, and then recover back along that same line because otherwise they will possibly double hit you. You know, people who get killed tend to be kind of mad at you afterwards, so we've got to protect ourselves from corpses. But our next technique is going to be winding up. Now, we can wind up in two ways. The first way shown, or rather discussed and then shown later, is going to be winding up with the short edge. Now, what this means is that, let's take off my glove real quick. As I'm winding up, I am going to push, I'll show it on this side, with my thumb upward. And as I lift my arms, I'm going to transition. So now my thumb is below, and my short edge will end up onto his sword. This is mentioned in the KDF itself. Um, the other form of winding being to just rake up along their blade with the long edge. What is the difference between the two? Strictly speaking, winding with the short edge is more complicated to learn, but easier to pull off, in my opinion, versus raking up with the long edge is easier to do, but tends to take a little bit more work to teach someone um, in that regard. Now, the reason that we're going over both of these here is because throughout the uh, treatise, it will kind of flip-flop on both, and most do. Sometimes they actively say, hey, employ your short edge so you can get a different line, whereas other times they say, just wind up, and it can be inferred that it's one or the other. But either way, what's going to happen here is we're going to come to a bind, same place we come down to the scales. Now, rather than being soft, he's fighting me for the middle. Now, this doesn't mean that he's actively pushing me. He's just trying to get his sword online as much as I'm trying to get sword online. From here, I stick my thumb up. I'm going to push up and wind. Now, in that case, my cross guard got stuck. That's okay. He's still locked out. That happens, right? But preferably, I'll end up with that sort of position where now my thumb is below and I'm winding with the short edge against him. So... That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it that we see shown is a bit funky, which is where I'm going to step forward with my left foot and also do a hand reversal. Now, why would you choose to do this? Well, in the scales position, they're a lot stronger on that middle line. It's no longer as easy to just pop up. 
That's why we're using the short edge to add some extra leverage or alternatively stepping forward with this other side. At first, I thought, why would you do this? But then after doing it for a little bit, it's actually pretty, pretty advantageous and sets you up in a really good position. Now, it could be inferred that they might be doing this with the short edge and reversing the hand, though it also works equally well if you don't reverse, sorry, if you don't use the short edge but still reverse your hand. Personally, I like not using the short edge for this particular wine. That's a personal preference based upon the earlier picture that they show, um, but you can infer and do it either way. Doesn't really matter. But what I'm gonna do for this guy is we're going to come into the scales. He's fighting me for the middle. I'm going to start pushing up as I would an ordinary wine. So I'm raising up my arm as I push my tip in against him. I'm not just raising, I'm pushing in at the same time. Now as I do this, I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to reverse it. So now my thumbs will be standing in opposite ways, like so. Now when that happens, to really make sure that I've got pressure against him, I'm going to step up to this side with my left foot and plunge in against him. So it should end up looking like this. Just like so. Now you notice that my arms are not right above my head. I'm pushing them out in the same direction as my foot. This is to ensure I really lock him out and that way he cannot respond against me. No one's strong enough to push through this, I guarantee. Even with one hand, right? But what I'm really doing is I'm putting all my eggs in one basket as I plunge against him. And if he chooses to try and deal with my point, we'll show the responses for there in a moment. But now, I'll show the wine a couple times. Both variations, that is. So first, just winding up with the short edge. Go ahead and bite me a bit more. There we go. That's the short edge technique. Now for the uh, step forward. In this case, I actually ended up plunging over his shoulder. That's okay. This does lead into a later technique that we'll cover probably in the next episode. So it's not the end of the world. Now the question then becomes, why reverse the backhand? What's the purpose of that? Well, we do actually see that happen in a couple other situations. We see it in the position known as the speaking window that is shown in uh, Peter Faulkner. We see it used when you're taking Bicorno in Fiore. And in general, uh, Meyer recommends reversing the hand in quite a few situations. What it's really doing is I'm opening up both of my arms, so now, I'm in kind of the optimal position to exert force on this side versus this way, I'm using the outside of one arm and the inside of the other. Now I'm using the inside of both, which is stronger. So you can still do it without reversing the hand, but really when you start reversing that hand, you're gonna get a lot of advantages. And of course, with this left step, it feels a lot more natural versus if I'm here and do it, I can still do it, but I don't quite have the same pressure as I did before. But that's both wines. Now we're going to move on to, of course, what happens when he deals with the point. Now, important thing here. It's important to remember that if you want to use these techniques that move in on this side, what I am not doing is doing a bad wind and then following through with it. What's happening is I am scaring him by putting my points in his face and he's doing the smart thing of worrying about that. So what I, what I mean by that? So we come into here, if I just push against him with either wine, and he just pushes back against my sword, I should still get him, right? With good speed and good intent upon my technique, probably eight times out of 10, I'll still get him. It's when he actively moves to defend against my point, and look very closely at what Ryan is doing here. He's moving back and away. There's no way I can get him here. Even if I went for the quickest, simplest one, right? Just that straight up thrust. We're here, if he moves to defend himself against my point, there's no way I will hit him. But of course, in moving to defend the point, he has left himself far more open on the other side, which is why it's okay for me to take these bigger tempo actions to 
cover that side. This is a very important thing to remember if you're trying to do opnamen, running in uh, the armed hand, because if you don't first get them afraid of that point and are just used to, oh, I'm worried about the cool part, so I'm not going to pay attention to the provocation that this thrust is, one, you miss out on opportunities to just stab people in the face, which is kind of what this is about, and two, they're not going to be reacting when you try to do it for realsies, because another thing to consider is if Ryan here winds up but isn't actually worried about getting my face, he's more worried about getting this line, here's probably what's going to happen. Okay? I'm not really scared of that. He starts moving in on the other side somehow. I can meet him very easily. I can counter with a slice of the arms. I can move in. We see a lot of actions that take the sword away from you here. We can also just, you know, back up and cut him. It's not hard for me to do that. The reason that I can get away with that is because he never scared me on the wine, so I never moved further than about here, which means it's very easy for me to come back. Versus, if the wine does come in, I'll be moving something like here, which is a much bigger opening for you to take. So make sure you pay as much attention to that wine as you do the cool bit of the technique. But let's go over what those bits are. So we get him scared of our point. Either way works. I can either step up with my left foot, or I can wind with the short edge, or I can do both. doesn't particularly matter. He moves to defend against the point, and it recommends I either rush in with the pommel or move into the armed hand. The armed hand is a common way of referring to going to half sword, basically, as it is a armored position. Um, now, these two transitions will look a bit like this. I'm here. I get him scared of that wine. He moves against my point. From here, it's very simple. All I got to do is step forward with my right foot. Boom. I can really put a lot of pressure into this. If I want to, I can just smother him and throw him. Personally, I like to do the nice, hard, you know, foot and pommel coming together. Just deck him. Um, obviously, I don't do that against, you know, people I'm actually sparring. I just set it up. But were I looking to put him on the ground, that's the one I'm looking for. That one's nice and simple. The other option I could do is moving into the arm's hand, in which case my footwork and handwork becomes a little more complicated, but we'll break it down for you. So, I'm here, I wind up and go to my point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to release with my left hand, and I'm going to let my short edge come back around me. At the same time, I'm doing a gathering step to get nice and close to him. As my sword comes over, I'm going to re-grip it with my hand that basically didn't move. And I should end up nice and close to him, thrusting in from above. So, here's that one one more time. We come in, I wind, up, in. Nice and simple. So now, I will throw on my mask, and we will show those two different attacks. Now, important thing, I'm going to try really hard to wind up and stab him in the face. This is a good thing to do when you're practicing this, because one, it teaches him to be quick on his defenses, and two, I'm making sure that he's afraid before I move into my next technique. So. Sometimes you may find that happen. My brain wanted to do the half sword transition, but my arms got stuck, so I just went okay and followed through with the pommel. I have time for mistakes like that because he's worried about the point. And those are really the first couple techniques. So we've got length which teaches us to stand in the scales and how to fight from therein. Then we've got measure, which teaches us long range hit, longer range hit with some added benefits because he's fighting us for the middle, and then two closer range techniques. That's kind of how the rest of the treatise is going to break down. There will be a concept with then some techniques that work from it that are also the baseline on which we will build our further actions. So over the course of the I don't know, probably next couple months to get through this whole thing. We'll be going over those actions probably in twos, sometimes in threes. And I will be having Ryan and others assist me with it. But 
Thank you very much for letting me abuse you. Um, and we'll go over the rest of Codex Wallerstein and fun things like that another time. <laughs>